Hello and welcome to the SHF SG Signal Generator Virtual Launch Event. Today you will see Zurich Instruments SHF SG in action. With its integrated frequency up conversion, up to 8 qubit control channels per instrument, and the possibility to synchronize up to 144 channels in one system, the SHF SG represents a major step forward in the effort to build a large scale quantum computer. To ensure the safety of everyone involved in the light of the current COVID-19 situation, we decided for an event format with pre-recorded presentations and demonstrations, but the final Q&A session will be live. You will have the opportunity to ask questions during the entire event. Please write your questions into the Q&A box. If they can be answered in a few sentences, they will be addressed directly in the Q&A box by our experts during the presentations. Other questions will be answered by our presenters during the live Q&A session. Let me now introduce our CMO, Jan, who will give you an overview of Zurich Instruments, of our mission in quantum computing, and of the tools we provide to help build the quantum computer. Thank you, Bruno. Let's start with some basic facts about the company. Zurich Instruments was founded in 2008 to disrupt the lock-in amplifier market and has since then grown to a company of 100 people from more than 20 nations. And we are also spread around the globe today. We have offices in China, the US and other places. And the proximity uh, to our academic customers allowed us early to realize that the requirements for the instrumentation on uh, quantum computing and the log and amplifier technology are actually quite close. And that inspired us to invest in that field. And today we see ourselves uh, to supporting customers worldwide to build uh, real useful quantum computers and see ourselves as the leading QCCS or quantum computing control system provider worldwide. Now, obviously quantum computing is uh, also very different than uh, building lock and amplifiers in a sense that it's a, a very new and evolving field. So many questions have not been answered yet or maybe not even asked. And that is an interesting challenge to have when committing building new hardware and software for it. So one important aspect is to focus on uh, certain technologies. And today we are looking at superconducting qubits and semiconductor spin qubits. So Zurich Instruments uh, is really committed to help progress and accelerate developments in uh, this field of noisy intermediate system quantum computers. Now, some of our customers uh, are uh, listed here. Obviously, we have many people in academia pursuing these efforts. So two examples are the Quantum Device Lab at ETH in Zurich, where we have a very close and fruitful collaboration with, but there's also uh, UC Berkeley, for instance, in the US, the Advanced Quantum Test Bed. But then we also have projects like Quantum Inspire. This is a very exciting one, it's the first European quantum computer that is in the cloud with two backends, one in spin qubits, one in uh, superconducting qubits. So you can control these machines uh, through the internet and have our machines running in the back. And we have IQM in Finland. This is a startup that specializes on building quantum computers for researchers and then big players like Intel who push the edge on, this, on the spin qubit side. Here on the right, you can see some of the recent success stories of our customers. So uh, publications uh, come in frequently and are very inspiring and motivating for us to, to help our customers uh, to, go, to go the next step. How do we do that? And uh, a lot of people will see Zurich Instrument mainly as a hardware manufacturer. And this is uh, true to a large extent. So whenever we build a new instrument, we try to get the best components to achieve high sensitivity, low noise, low drift, and so on and so on. 
but this is only uh, a part of the story. Another big part is actually on the software side. This is where we can make a huge difference in terms of efficient workflows, the features, the level of automation that we gain through our graphical user interface and the API connections. And I think one important part that is often underappreciated is the fact that uh, through software updates, you actually get better and better systems over time. And in our case, this is currently free of charge. Now, if you look at quantum computing control systems, what do we aim at? So we want to go uh, on, a, on a single system paradigm. So if you look at the quantum stack, we are basically situated between the qubits where all the magic happens and then the higher layers of the stack, third-party software like IBM Qiskit, and then even higher the application where all the, the value is generated. And to, to have this uh, transition as smooth as possible, it's really important to have a software package in place uh, that gets this connection done. And if we look in the market today, we see uh, mainly two approaches to the topic. And the one uh, which probably gets most of the attention is the so-called scaling thrust. And those are the people who try to um, max the number of qubits and try to build bigger and bigger system. Uh, what's on their mind are things like logical qubits and quantum error correction to, to do really useful stuff. Uh, more on the technology side, I would say there is uh, ambitions to increase the channel density and also to reduce the cost for each uh, individual qubit. Then on the, on the other side of the graph here, down here, uh, you see the technology thrust, which runs in parallel and where people build and maintain smaller setups to improve the basic building blocks and ingredients. So qubit coherence time, improving gate fidelities and speed of algorithms, things like fast qubit initialization and so on. Our goal is to support both thrusts equally and uh, provide a hardware and a software that can be used on both arms. And the idea is to, to keep the complexity in the labs as low as possible and also to allow uh, the, the results gained from the, the, the technology thrust easily uh, taken over into the, the scaling thrust. So if you look at the roadmap, as mentioned, it all started 2014 when we added uh, AWG functionality to our lock-ins, but it soon evolved. And uh, in 2018, we introduced the world's first commercially available quantum computing control system, Generation 1. And that was uh, a combination of instruments uh, specifically designed for quantum computing and also assembled in a way that things like synchronization of all the instruments are, are automatically taken care of and that there's also a pulse level programming available. So this system already uh, made things like active qubit reset and quantum error correction uh, possible. And the question now is how to push this further. And uh, what we are currently working on is the second generation. And this has already been introduced uh, end of last year, the first instrument, the SHF QA, so a quantum analyzer. And today is an exciting day for us because we introduced the SHF SG, which is a signal generator specifically designed for qubit control. And what does generation two uh, in general mean? So it means significant progress both on the software side and on the hardware side. And one important marker on the hardware side is the fact that the whole microwave generation and detection is integrated into the instrument. In our case, we decided for a double super heterodyne technology, which we believe gives the best performance in terms of pure spectra, but also increases the system performance in terms of lower drifts and lower latency. So ultimately we expect 
uh, better system utilization, so uh, longer uptimes, and also an improvement in the in the fidelities of the algorithms and uh, the qubits. And with this, I want to uh, hand over back to Bruno, who gives a, a quick introduction about qubit control, and then Mark will continue on explaining the new instrument and give a demo. I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, back to you, Bruno. Thank you, Jan, for this introduction. Now, let's have a closer look at the instrument. The SHFSG is the first signal generator designed specifically for the control of multi-qubit systems and that operates directly at their typical frequencies. But let me provide you with a quick introduction into the topic of qubit control, the challenges that it brings and the highlights of the SHFSG for this application. Mark will then afterwards show you more of the exciting technology that is found within and demonstrate the instrument to you in a hands-on way. Let's begin by discussing how qubits are controlled on a theoretical level. A quantum computer based on any technology, superconductors, semiconductor spins or trapped ions consists of qubits, which are quantum systems with two distinct states, let's call them state 0 and 1. Abstractly, a qubit state can be represented by a point on a sphere, the Bloch sphere, as you see it here on the right. In order to operate the quantum computer, we need to be able to bring each of its qubits into an arbitrary state, which is a superposition of the states 0 and 1. We may do this by applying a driving field resonant with the transition between 0 and 1 for a certain time, or in other words, a single qubit gate pulse. For instance, by applying a pi half pulse, we may bring the qubit into this superposition of 0 and 1 on the equator of the sphere. The area under the pulse envelope determines the total rotation angle of the arrow. So by applying a pulse of twice the amplitude, we will end up in the state 1 at the south pole of the sphere. The direction of the rotation on the Bloch sphere is controlled with the phase of the pulse. For instance, starting out in state 0 and applying a pulse with a 90 degree shifted phase compared to the previous pulses will cause a rotation of the arrow on a 90 degree shifted meridian of the sphere. We end up in a different complex superposition between 0 and 1. We just saw the effect of a pulse on a single qubit, but a quantum computer contains many qubits and in addition to the single qubit gate operations, the control system needs to be able to apply two qubit gate operations in order to create entangled states between qubits. In superconducting qubit systems, two qubit gates are realized using radio frequency pulses, like those used for single qubit gates, or by using flux bias pulses. In a Zurich Instruments QCCS, all radio frequency pulses are generated by the SHFSG, while flux pulses are generated by the HDAWG arbitrary waveform generator. Today we'll focus on the SHFSG, and so we won't discuss the flux pulses and the HDAWG here. Realizing all these gates in quantum computing in practice comes with very demanding requirements on the quality of the used signals, especially in comparison to classical computing. In classical computing, gate operations have a relatively large error margin and can tolerate imperfections in the electrical control signal. In quantum computing, each imperfection, such as a phase error, noise contributions or amplitude drift, directly propagates into an error in the, in the qubit state control, or in other words, degrades gate fidelity. Some types of two-qubit gate operations, for instance swap gates, are sensitive to the relative phase between qubits, so the control system needs to make sure that phase between different signal lines is reproducible and well controlled. So how are these control signals actually generated? A qubit control system typically contains two main elements. A digital pulse generation unit that allows to the user to freely program any pulse shape required and generate these as analog signals using a digital to analog converter with sub nanosecond time resolution. Superconducting qubit frequencies typically lie between 4 and 8 GHz, which is about an order of magnitude larger than the required signal bandwidth supplied by the pulse generation unit. Qubit control systems therefore contain a second element, 
which is a frequency upconversion stage. Together with the necessary filtering and amplification, the signal is then ready to be sent via an RF line to the qubit held at cryogenic temperatures. The SHF-SG integrates all of these elements on each of its channels and its RF outputs can be directly connected to a cryostat without any extra components. Scaling up the number of channels to accommodate for ever larger quantum processors comes with several new or accentuated challenges. Knowing about the importance of these challenges defined the framework in which we have developed the SHF-SG and decided where we have put emphasis to enable the control of larger systems. I have spoken about the signal fidelity, which surely ranks highest in the priority list for a good qubit control system, because you don't want that gate fidelity is ever limited by the control electronics. Larger quantum processors have more degrees of freedom and use more line crossings, which means there are more paths through which crosstalk can occur. This means the sensitivity of the processor to spurious tones gets larger and it's therefore especially important to count on a large spurious free dynamic range instead of tracking down sources of crosstalk in the experiment. With more qubits on a chip, more time has to be spent on calibrating the required gates and it gets more important to rely on low drift to ensure long intervals of gate calibration. With longer coherence times, the control pulse patterns become longer and with more qubits they become wider. Overall, the amount of information contained in one pulse pattern gets larger and larger. During tune-up or when executing batch batches of quantum computing jobs, these patterns programmed on the control system need to be exchanged frequently and there is a danger that the instrument communication time becomes so large that a full calibration in useful time beco even becomes impossible. It's therefore essential that the control system supports the compression of the data contained in a, in a sequence to reduce the instrument communication time. Tracking down errors coming from individual setup components such as amplifiers, mixers, connectors or clock sources is a lab reality and costs measurement time. As channel numbers grow, it's essential to keep the number of potential error sources small, which is why we believe every generation of qubit control systems should increase the degree of integration and automation. Timing synchronicity is important to ensure gate alignment, and errors in synchronization are difficult to track down. That's particularly so in a running system that is remotely controlled and only offers the final measurement data as source of information to diagnose the error. A synchronization architecture that is both reliable and ensures constant timing accuracy when adding channels is thus an important feature of a qubit control system. And how does the SHF-SG achieve this? First, the instrument integrates frequency upconversion up to 8.5 GHz and this by getting rid of the mixer calibration that is needed in conventional setups so far. Its RF front end provides excellent spectral purity and low noise to ensure that you can achieve the maximum gate fidelity supported by the quantum device. Advanced real-time sequencing capabilities allow you to define even the most complex gate patterns with a minimum amount of waveform memory and with full compatibility with real-time feedback methods. With Zurich Instruments SetSync protocol, up to 18 SHF units with 144 channels can be synchronized using a Zurich Instruments PQSC. Thanks to the compact size of the SHF SG and all other components of the QCCS, a 100 qubit control system containing all RF, flux, and readout channels fits in less than two 19 inch racks. But now, enough of the promotion. Let's get practical and dive deeper into the technical details of the instrument and observe firsthand how we achieve this performance. Mark will take over now and guide you through this main part of the launch event. Thanks Bruno for the introduction and for the overview of Qubit Control. It is my pleasure to talk in more detail about the capabilities of the SHFSG, including using two demos to show the types of signals the SHFSG can generate. In the first part, I'll talk about our frequency upconversion technique and how it can generate low noise signals at up to 8.5 GHz. 
Then you'll get to see this upconversion in action during a demo of a Robbie sequence. Next, we'll look at more complicated pulse sequences, showing in another demo how you can implement randomized benchmarking using our advanced pulse sequencer. And in the final part, we'll answer all of your questions in a live Q&A session. Type your questions into the chat at any point during the presentation, and we'll answer them in part three. And with that, let's start by discussing the Robbie sequence. The Robbie pulse sequence is often one of the first steps in characterizing your qubits and setting up your gate sequences. So any good signal generator has to be able to do it well. The analog properties of the signal generator are crucial for setting a good foundation for the rest of your sequences. So what are the key ingredients for a good Robbie sequence? Well, obviously, the frequency has to be right. And the noise and spurious tones should be low to avoid driving unwanted transitions. And on top of that, high bandwidth and high output amplitudes are important for achieving fast Robbie times. The high bandwidth and high output power are answered easily. The SHFSG can output microwave pulses with up to 10 dBm of output power, enabling fast single qubit gates. It also has a 1 GHz modulation bandwidth, making it possible to generate short pulses, or pulses with sharp features. The frequency generation and noise are subtler discussions, though, which we will dive into now. So what are the different methods for generating microwave pulses? Well, the starting point is the digital pulse generation at baseband, typically below 500 megahertz. But ultimately, this baseband signal has to be upconverted to match the qubit frequency, for example, at 6 gigahertz. And there's a handful of techniques that can be used to achieve this. In direct RF, higher Nyquist zones are used to reach gigahertz frequencies without analog mixers, though possibly with some amplification. On the other hand, a single IQ mixer could be used to upconvert the probe signal. This is the simplest approach to implement in practice, which is why it's also the standard approach. And finally, there are double superheterodyne approaches that involve more sophisticated analog conversion schemes. For those not familiar with this technique, double superheterodyne approaches are often used in vector network analyzers, as IQ mixing methods can't provide the high performance needed for VNAs. At Zurich Instruments, we chose this final method. So why don't we use direct RF or IQ mixing? Well, clearly, direct RF would be the most desirable solution. But unfortunately, we just don't think the technology is there yet to make this a viable approach. There are currently just too many technical limitations that make it difficult to achieve good bandwidth, high digital resolution, and low added latency at a reasonable cost. So we're going to focus on a comparison between IQ mixing and the double superheterodyne technique that we use to show why the latter is worth the extra effort. Now, IQ mixing schemes are indeed simple to set up, but they suffer from spurious tones and drift, and their calibration covers a relatively narrow bandwidth. Let's first look at the noise properties. Here you see a spectrum of an already optimized and calibrated IQ mixing system that performs upconversion of a single tone at 6 GHz. In addition to the signal that we want, we see other harmonics and sidebands of the upconversion process, as well as leakage of the local oscillator. There is not much that can be done about the second order peaks, but the LL leakage and the first order or minus one order are suppressed by uh, calibrating the mixer. Why do we want to suppress these spurious tones? Because the more of them that we have, the more intermodulation between all the signals there is. And this will ultimately reduce the signal to noise ratio of our measurements or impose serious engineering challenges to get rid of all these tones. This gets even more complicated if you consider sending in multiple tones that you might want to vary in frequency. Now, the calibration does not last forever. And even small temperature changes in the lab can change the suppression of the other sidebands, as shown here in a recently published article. Over the course of just two hours, the ratio between the first order sidebands changed dramatically. And that means you have to spend time not measuring just to recalibrate the mixers. Keeping these spurious tones in check can cost a lot of system downtime. How does our approach compare? Well, first of all, our approach provides a much cleaner spectrum without any calibration needed, as you can see by the absence of spurious tones. In addition, we do not observe a drift of the performance over time. To show how stable our approach is, we turned up the ambient temperature around the instruments by 10 degrees Celsius. By looking at the spurious free dynamic range, which is the ratio between the desired signal and the high spurious tone, 
we see that changing the temperature causes the IQ mixer calibration to degrade, leading to an increase in the unwanted LO and negative sideband peaks. Our approach, however, remains unfazed, even by this drastic temperature change. That means we can retain a clean and stable spectrum over time and temperature. No time wasted on recalibration routines. But there's another advantage to the double superheterodyne technique, one that is especially important for short pulses, or pulses with sharp features. The calibration of the IQ mixers is valid for a relatively narrow bandwidth around the carrier frequency, maybe a few hundred megahertz. In contrast, our approach has a one gigahertz bandwidth without needing any recalibration. To illustrate this clearly, let's begin by looking at a calibrated IQ mixing approach. We see two peaks that are nearly suppressed by the calibration, the lower sideband and the LO leakage. But what happens if we sweep the offset frequency without changing the calibration? We see that the farther we are from the calibrated frequency, the worse the suppression of the lower sideband becomes. And actually, we see that the calibration works over a relatively narrow range of at most about 100 megahertz. And this isn't something we can fix with recalibration. All recalibration will do is shift where that minimum is. This means that for broadband pulses, the spectral edges of the pulses could give rise to unwanted signals at the lower sideband due to the limited bandwidth of the IQ mixer calibration. How does the SHFSG compare? Well, if we sweep the offset frequency such that the amplitudes are the same as with the IQ mixing approach, we see no sign of LO leakage, and we see barely any sign of the lower sideband at all. The spurious tones stay filtered out regardless of the offset frequency. Here we overlay these plots for a final comparison to highlight the difference between them. And by the way, the IQ mixer calibration is also valid only at a single drive amplitude. If you vary the amplitude with an IQ mixing approach, you'll run into a similar problem. What this means is that the SHFSG allows you to use the full dynamic range of the signal without worrying about spurious tones or images of the pulses in the spectrum. So compared to IQ mixing, the double superheterodyne technique doesn't need mixer calibration, is more stable, has better noise and spurious tone for performance, and has a higher bandwidth. But if this technique is so powerful, why isn't everyone already using it? Why do so many research groups and even companies continue to use the IQ mixing approach? Well, the short answer is that the double superheterodyne technique takes some thought and care to implement well. It can outperform IQ mixing in terms of noise and stability and bandwidth, but as you can see here, it requires careful design and selection of filters, synthesizers, and other components. That initial design hurdle can be a major barrier for non-experts and for researchers who need their results yesterday. Even so, the improved noise performance and better bandwidth convinced us that double superheterodyne is the way to go which is why we put in the extra effort to make the benefits of this technique more accessible to users. So how does the double superheterodyne technique actually work? Well, we start with the digital baseband signal, which describes the pulse envelope, the modulation frequency, the phase, and the separation between pulses. This baseband signal is digitally upconverted to two gigahertz and then converted into an analog signal. The analog signal is then low pass filtered and afterwards, we bring in the first local oscillator at 10 GHz, provided by one of the low phase noise synthesizers of the SHF-SG. The 10 GHz LO upconverts the analog signal to 12 GHz, which then passes through a narrow bandpass filter to prevent LO leakage and to reject the lower sideband. Next, the signal at 12 GHz interacts with another local oscillator, this one variable between 13 and 20 GHz. This variable LO down converts the 12 GHz signal to the desired output frequency. For example, an 8 GHz center frequency is achieved by setting the variable LO to 20 GHz. This 8 GHz signal then passes through variable amplifiers and filters, helping to ensure clean output signals with a high output power. Let's focus on this last step for a second. Because the variable LO has a range spanning 7 GHz, that means we can achieve RF center frequencies at the output from 1 GHz to 8 GHz. The variable filters in amplification are chosen specifically to be compatible with this range. So that's how the upconversion process works in the SHFSG. And notice that only the green and blue bands overlap. The other bands and LOs are kept well separated, 
which helps us ensure spurious free signals for high fidelity gates. In fact, we've deliberately designed the SHFSG with a few applications in mind. For example, many superconducting qubits have their resonance frequencies between 4 and 8 gigahertz, which falls neatly into the RF output range of the SHFSG. On top of that, spin qubits can have a variety of frequencies, and the trend we've observed is toward lower and lower qubit frequencies. For spin qubit frequencies below 8 gigahertz, the SHFSG can also be a good fit. But what about two qubit gates? Well, if we look at superconducting qubits, there are a few types of two qubit gates. There are cross resonance gates, which span a frequency range similar to the single qubit frequencies. But there are also lower frequency two qubit gates, such as parametric two qubit gates, with sender frequencies typically below one gigahertz. And because we've observed this trend to use lower frequency two qubit gates, we wanted to make sure that the SHFSG can cover the full range from DC to 8.5 gigahertz. So how do we achieve center frequencies below one gigahertz? Well, there's a second path available to bypass the upconversion scheme. For center frequencies between DC and two gigahertz, we offer the low frequency path, which involves some amplification and the ability to add an offset voltage. In this case, we vary the center frequency of the output by changing the frequency of the oscillator that we use in the digital upconversion, which happens before the digital to analog conversion. For the RF path, the frequency of this digital oscillator is fixed at 2 GHz, but for the LF path, it is variable between 0 and 2 GHz. The two paths can be freely switched between by the user, and broadly speaking, the RF path is designed with single qubit gates in mind, whereas the LF path is aimed at lower frequency 2 qubit gates. There's also good overlap between the frequency ranges of the LF and RF paths to make sure that switching between them is not cumbersome and doesn't hinder frequency sweeps. Now that we've seen how the frequency upconversion technique works, let's take a look at how we can actually use the SHFSG to generate a Rabi sequence. So our goal is to perform a Rabi sequence with the SHFSG. And there's a few uh, preliminary steps to get everything set up and running first. So we're going to begin by loading the packages we need uh, for Python, since we're working with a Jupyter notebook here. And one of the most important is ZI Python. So let's run this. Next, we want to actually connect to the instruments. And we'll be using two instruments for this demo. One is an SHFSG, of course. And we're also going to use a PQSE to help synchronize the outputs of the channels of the, of the SHFSG. So this is just, the PQSE is just for synchronization. We connect to these instruments by specifying the server host, the server port, the type of interface. And here we actually connect two of the individual instruments using the ZI DAC server and connect device commands. So we'll also use an oscilloscope for viewing the waveforms later. But these are the instruments we need to connect to for now. Next, we want to define some helper functions to help us upload and compile our, our sequencer code. And we're also going to define a helper function to let us calculate the envelope of our wave functions or of our, of our waveforms. So in this case, we're using uh, Gaussian waveforms entirely. So with that preliminary stuff set up, we're now going to set up the parameters of the RF path for, for the RF frequency generation. And here we're going to set all channels to be one gigahertz. So we do this by, we set all channels to the one gigahertz by using a for loop. And the two most important commands are these two, where we set the RF frequency to the variable here, and we turn on the outputs. Now it's already time to perform our first Fabi sequence. We do that by setting up a few parameters that we'll use throughout the script, mainly the pi and pi half amplitudes and the pi and pi half lengths. So in both cases, the lengths are 50 nanoseconds, and we simply vary between the pi and pi half pulses, we simply vary the amplitudes by a factor of two. We actually define the um, pulse envelope, the, the waveform here, right? So we calculate a list of points using the predefined function above. And here we separate the real and imaginary parts of this, of this calculated waveform and save them separately as two different CSV files so we can upload them later to the sequencer. Here we set the marker source for triggering the scope. And this line, we turn off the AWG outputs just in case it was running from a sequence before. And here is now already the heart of the, of the sequencer code. So this, this is what we'll actually upload to the, sequence, to the sequencer 
And again, the code begins with defining a few constants that we want to use in our, in our Rabi sequence. So in this case, 20 different pulse amplitudes. And here we upload the real and imaginary parts of the waveform that we calculated above. This part is the loop that will actually perform the Rabi sequence. And we do a few things here. So first, we set up triggering for the scope, for the oscilloscope. And then this is the actual Rabi loop. So the idea here is that we play the real and imaginary parts of the waves together. And we, through, it, through each iteration of the, of the loop, we increment the amplitudes of the, of the Gaussian waveform. And then we have some, some wait time for our readout here. Good. After, so we've defined our, our Rabi sequence. And now it's time to actually upload it to the core. And we do that by establishing some, some parameters, some connection parameters to the, to the core, and specifically the index of which core we want to upload to. In this case, the first core, indexed by 0. And then we can compile and upload the, the sequencer code that we defined above. After we've done that, it's just a matter of turning on the AWG output so we can view what's happening on the scope. So let's run this and look at the scope. And what you see is 20 Rabi pulses playing smoothly and playing continuously. So if we zoom in, we see that it is running in a continuous loop here, and it's running reproducibly. So that's already how you can perform a single channel Rabi. But what happens if you want to perform a multi-channel Rabi measurement? Well, in that case, we can um, upload the, the sequencer code to multiple channels. And I'm going to make a few small changes. So I'm going to set the second th synthesizer to 2 gigahertz so we can tell the difference between the two outputs. That's done here. As before, I'm going to turn off um, all the, or, or disable all the AWG outputs just to keep everything clean and nice. And here is something new. I've added some parameters for the PQSC that I mentioned before that allows us to synchronize the outputs of the two channels, right? So that everything lines up nicely in time and, and is stable. So, the sequencer code is almost identical to what we used before, with one small change. I have now added this wait z-sync trigger so that the two channels wait for the signal from the PQSC before playing uh, the Rabi sequences. So that's just to help everything keep uh, stay synchronized. Again, as before, we can upload and compile the, the new sequencer code. And now we do that in a for loop, since we have to do it for, for two different channels. And we also enable the AWG outputs as before. So let's run this and see our multi-channel playback. And what we see is that the two sequences are overlapping perfectly, playing synchronously as well. And again, if we zoom in, we see that it's running continuously, and that the second output is playing at exactly twice the frequency of the first, so just as expected. So everything seems to be working well and playing perfectly. And that's how you can already run a multi-channel Rabi sequence on the SHFSG. So that's how we can use the SHFSG to generate a Rabi sequence. In fact, we already have some data from the first measurements done with an SHFSG. Here you see a Rabi measurement done at the Quantum Device Lab at ETH Zurich using a pulse length of 50 nanoseconds. Now that we've generated our first pulses, let's take a deeper look at the properties of our pulse sequencer. Then we'll finish this part by looking at how we can generate a randomized benchmarking sequence. Just as a Rabi measurement is an important tool for characterizing your qubits and setting up your gate sequences, randomized benchmarking is an important tool for quantifying the fidelity of your gates. So what's needed for randomized benchmarking? Ultimately, we have to be able to play a random set of gates drawn from the set of Clifford gates, each of which has a different combination of pulse amplitudes and phases. And we have to be able to generate and play sequences with different numbers of Clifford gates, ranging from just a few to several hundred or even 1,000 Cliffords. Finally, depending on what we want to do, for example, simultaneous randomized benchmarking, we might need multi-channel playback. In fact, we might even want to play different sequences on different channels. And because we may have a variety of waveforms of different lengths with different sequences playing on different channels, we need to ensure that the memory of the sequencer is being used efficiently. So let's take a closer look at the internal architecture of the SHFSG. In the first part of this presentation, we focused on the analog signal upconversion and described the double superheterodyne technique. 
But now let's work, work, work backwards, going back through the signal generation chain to talk about the digital waveform generation, which is all FPGA based. There are two aspects I want to talk about in more detail. Digital modulation, which allows us to reuse pulse envelopes, and then a feature of the AWG sequencer that we've named the command table. Let's first discuss digital modulation. And let's say you want to generate a Gaussian pulse with a modulation of 100 megahertz. You could calculate the modulated waveform and upload it to the AWG core and directly send this pulse to be upconverted. But this is an inefficient use of memory because this pulse cannot be reused at a later time with a different frequency or phase. Another way to modulate the pulse is to use internal digital oscillators programmed into the FPG architect architecture with real-time control over the frequency and the phase in the sequencer. These oscillators run in the background without consuming memory and can then be multiplied with the output of the AWG when needed. Because the modulation can be done digitally and doesn't have to be stored in the waveform, you don't have to define the modulation sample by sample, meaning you can save on waveform memory usage and upload times. All that needs to be stored is the envelope of the pulse, and that same envelope can be reused with different frequency and phase settings. But in quantum computing, just reusing the pulse envelopes is not enough. We need something beyond digital modulation. Ideally, we want to be able to define an entire gate, meaning the waveform, the phase, the frequency, and the amplitude with a single instruction. We call our approach to this problem the command table, and it's a way of indexing waveforms and modulation parameters and consolidating multiple parameter updates into a single instruction. The command table itself is a JSON file that is uploaded alongside the sequencer code to the AWG core. The entries of the command table can include information about which waveforms to play and what phase and amplitudes to play them with. For example, here you can see how each table entry has a waveform associated with it, as well as amplitude and phase settings. When you execute one of these table entries in the sequencer program, all of the waveform, amplitude, and phase changes are made, but only a single instruction is used. This means you can achieve fast phase updates between pulses and that long, complex sequences with many changing parameters won't run into limits due to the instruction memory. The command table and the digital modulation are so powerful together that one of my colleagues recently helped a customer massively reduce their upload time of a full randomized benchmarking sequence using an HDAWG. Now, we're working hard to bring the same functionality to the SHFSG, but even though it's not quite there yet, we're still able to do quite a lot with it. So let's look now at what we can already do. And that brings us to the second and final demo. Here, we'll show how we can actually generate a randomized benchmarking sequence. Let's have a look. Now we want to see how we can perform a randomized benchmarking sequence with the SHFSG. We've already connected to the SHFSG and set up the basic parameters from before. So we begin by defining the parameters for the Clifford gates. Here we define each of the different um, pulses needed, each with their own amplitude, length, and phase. Here we actually use these pulses to build up the different Clifford um, gates, so the, the parameters for the gates. And down here, this is where we actually calculate the envelopes. Um, so we, we take the parameters from here to make the Clifford gates, and here we calculate the actual uh, waveforms, the, the arrays. So let's run this. Now we actually want to generate the sequence that we're going to upload to the sequencer. To make things reproducible, we start by using a random seed, and then we select 16 of these different Clifford gates from the total set of 24. After we've selected these 16, we combine them into a single long list of, of data points, and we modulate uh, this, this set of data points with a 100 megahertz modulation. So that's done here, where we modulate this the list of points from before. Then just as before, we take the real and imaginary parts, save them as separate CSV files so that we can upload them to the AWG core. So. Now we can actually play the sequence that we just generated. As before, we shut off the AWG from running if it was already running earlier, and we set some appropriate parameters for the PQSC for synchronization. In this case, the sequencer code is pretty simple. 
we wait for the trigger from the PQSC as before. We set a trigger for the scope, and then it's just a matter of playing the, the wave, the randomized benchmarking waves that we saved earlier. Also similar to the earlier part of the demo, we um, set up all the communication with the AWG and upload the core and or, or upload the, the code to the core and compile it. Then we turn on the AWG and we can look at the output. And what you see is 16 Clifford gates playing beautifully. If we zoom in, you see that even though the, it's repeating, even though the sequence is repeating, it's playing perfectly stably and the same sequence every time. But let's repeat it now with a longer sequence. We we'll use the same seed as before, but now repeat it with 250 Clifford gates instead. All the steps here are pretty much the same as before, including the creating a single long list, modulating that, that waveform, saving it in real and imaginary parts, and setting up the relevant parameters for timing, uploading the sequence. So skip over the details, and we can just upload this, calculate and upload this new waveform. If we go back now to the scope, we see a much, much longer sequence playing now with basically no problem, right? I'm not gonna count the gates individually. Good, so we can play uh, randomized, benchmarking with up to, randomized benchmarking with up to 250 Clifford gates already. But you could see that there were different amplitudes of the pulses, but what about the phases? This is, this is a bit harder to see just by zooming in. So let's take a look, let's zoom in on just two of these gates, focusing on the X and Y gates. I select them out from the list of Clifford gates from above, and um, just as before, calculate waveforms in them, modulate those waveforms, and save them separately. Now, if we upload these two waveforms to the um, AWG core in a new sequencer, we should be able to see the X and Y gates playing, um, playing on the channels. So here, the sequencer code I'm using is to set a trigger, play the X gate, then to set another trigger, and then play the Y gate. Because of the persistence on the scope, we'll be able to see the overlap between the two, between the X and Y gates, and therefore check the face. So let's upload this code and the, um, the, uh, the waveform files and play it and see what happens. So let's zoom in. Let's move it over a bit to within view, and if we zoom in, we see that exactly because of the persistence of the scope, we see an overlap between the X and Y gates and that there's a, a 90 degree phase shift between them. So everything seems to be working as planned. Good. So we've checked that the amplitudes and phases are playing correctly, but now let's look at multi-channel playback. And we begin this part by generating another long randomized benchmarking sequence, but with a different seed. So that'll be a different set of Clifford gates. Just like above, we draw 250 of these gates, make a waveform out of them using the same steps as before. So if we run this section, and now, again, it's just a matter of setting the right parameters for, for synchronization between the channels, and, but now we have to upload two different sequencer codes. So to one core, we'll play this first original long um, randomized benchmark sequence we have from before, and on the second core, we'll play the second, uh, the second newly generated long randomized benchmarking sequence. But otherwise, the codes are the same. And we also upload the first sequencer code to the first core and the second sequencer code to the second core. So let's run this and see how it looks. If we zoom out, as we were still zoomed in before, we see that the gates are overlapping nicely, frequencies are still set properly, and even though the waveforms are of different lengths in total, you, it's the same number of Clifford gates, but different lengths in terms of number of samples, it's still playing seamlessly um, on both channels. So different sequences on different channels playing perfectly smoothly and repeating. So that's how you can perform a randomized benchmarking measurement on the SG 
even across multiple channels. So let's return now to the main presentation. So we can already run randomized benchmarking with a couple hundred Clifford gates. And in fact, here too, the Quantum Device Lab has provided some nice preliminary results of a single qubit randomized benchmarking measurements using an SHFSG and up to 256 Clifford gates. So we can already run randomized benchmarking sequences with the SHFSG, and everything I've shown today was done with a single SHFSG. The SHFSG becomes even more powerful when combined with other instruments, including other SHFSGs in a QCCS system. If you'd like to know more about the SHFSG or any of our other devices, then call or email us to set up a personalized product demo. We're always happy to discuss your applications to ensure you get the right set of instruments for what you want to do. And with that, we have finished the main part of this presentation, and I would like to thank you for listening. We now look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A session. All right. Hi again, at this time live. Uh, thank you for your attention. I hope you could enjoy the presentation so far. Now in this uh, last part, uh, Mark, Jan, and I will try to address the questions that you have put in the Q&A box. And as we do so, please uh, go ahead and add more questions if you have them. Uh, we'll spend about 15 minutes or so uh, to answer as many as we can. And uh, let's dive in. So I will go ahead. Uh, and the first question uh, was related to uh, the part that Mark presented. So that's uh, the following. Is the SHF-SG good for other types of qubits besides superconducting and spin qubits? So please, Mark. Yeah, thank you, Bruno. So um, you're right, we focused mostly on superconducting and spin qubits during the presentation. But actually, we suspect or we hope that the SHFSG is also a good match for some other types of, of systems, so including color centers and V centers. The frequency range seems to be a good overlap. Um, and also, NMR has the potential to be a good match here, too. Um, and we, we're always happy to talk about you, uh, to talk with you about your applications to see if there's some synergy there, right? So even if we didn't mention your application in this talk, please reach out to us. We're happy to discuss anytime. All right, thank you. Let's go to the second question that was uh, for the first part, Jan's part. So the question is, do you have to make uh, compromises when designing a system both for small setups, so technology thrust, and large setups, scaling thrust? So please, Jan. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, let me think about it. So if we, if we look at uh, larger systems, I think it's very beneficial. Uh, for customers when they are very flexible to pick uh, different kinds of instruments and also tailor the, the number of channels exactly to, to what their qubit and the number of qubits is actually uh, requiring. <clears throat> and uh, so when we compare that then to the, to the technology thrust where uh, people want to basically use the instrument standalone, I think there's no uh, principal conflict. So what we have to take care of is basically on the hardware side that the individual instruments work by themselves. And on the software side, uh, that there is basically a level, uh, an instrument level software where each instrument can be controlled. And that is uh, anyway our natural approach to these matters. So we basically just keep going. And uh, along those lines, I don't think it's a big compromise. It might be a different situation if we look at uh, much larger systems in the future, uh, when uh, cost consideration of the hardwares get more and more uh, prominent. And uh, I think this analysis is uh, not yet fully done, but uh, it's definitely on our mind. All right, thank you, Jan. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take the next question. So that is uh, related to a statement uh, that was in my part regarding the flux pulses. So why is the SHF-SG not used for flux pulses, but only for the RF pulses? Uh, so yes, it's true. We uh, proposed that uh, the uh, radio frequency single qubit gates and, and radio frequency two qubit gates are generated by the SHF-SG, but for uh, flux bias pulses, we do recommend the HDAWG, which is, uh, which is a product which is out uh, a few years uh, already. And uh, 
it's actually the SHF SG bandwidth goes really down to um, uh, to DC. So uh, you will be able to uh, generate uh, DC pulses as well as you know them. So if you have a, a SHF SG and uh, you you require flux pulses, you will be able to gen generate them. It's still not uh, the best solution because the compromise that you uh, that you uh, have when you use the SHFST for one, uh, the output resolution, so it's two bits less. Uh, so 14 bits versus 16 bits and this, the, the bit resolution for hitting the, um, uh, the plateau level on the flux pulse is just something uh, uh, really important. Also the, um, available signal amplitude on the HJWG is, uh, is larger than the one that is offered by the low frequency path on the SG. And uh, third reason also on the HJWG, you will, you will have uh, the uh, real-time pre-compensation feature available, which is not available on the SG. So overall, the HG is just a better solution for the flux pulses. Uh, and that's why we would recommend it. Good. I will also just take the next one, which is more uh, 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 another technical question. So a question about whether this recording will be available for watching, will it be published again? And along the same lines, will the slides be available? So the recording, of course, will be published. You will be able to find it on the YouTube channel and also on our website. As for the slides, so we usually don't uh, slides for a download, but uh, please get in touch with us uh, if you uh, like to get a copy of these slides. And then let's go to the next technical question and see uh, again one from Mark. So you show the system with several SHF SGs, but only a single SHF QA. How realistic is this? So Mark, please. Yep. Thanks, Bruno. So um, it, it's realistic. Uh, the, the SHF QA can have multiplexed readouts. So it can read out each channel of the QA, or the SHF QA can read out multiple qubits. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking of, for example, a Surface 17 setup, um, you want to build something like this, you could do this, for example, with two SHFSG eight channel versions and one four channel SHFSG, but you would only need a single SHF QA to do the readout uh, corresponding to that. So the, the SHFSGs for the, for the control of the, of the Surface 17 and then the uh, single QA for SHF QA for the readout. And so that, that's why it makes sense to have typically more SHF SGs than SHF QAs in a, in a QCCS system. Back to you, Bruno. Thank you. Um, all right, so I'm gonna take the next one. Uh, what is the reason for using six gigahertz? So uh, we think, I think this question referred to the uh, measurements, the comparison measurements shown between the SHF SG uh, and the H and uh, IQ mixes with regard to the spurious free dynamic range um, and the temperature dependence of these spurious tones. Uh, there is no strong reason, except that it's really in the middle of the interesting frequency range for superconducting qubits, so between the four and eight gigahertz, where these uh, effects would matter most. And uh, qualitatively, then we also quantitatively, the difference would not be uh, uh, so different measuring between, for instance, at four or at eight gigahertz. So the conclusion would stay the same. Overall, this is for the single qubit gates, is the, uh, for superconducting qubit gates, is the uh, most relevant frequency uh, range. But the, the advantages over IQ mixing hold actually over the full available range. Good, maybe then back to Mark. What about the waveform loading, loading time and how it can be loaded? Uh, right, so we have a few ways of, of generating or loading waveforms. As you saw in the demos, we, you can generate CSV files and upload those um, to, to the course. Uh, we also have uh, built-in functions for generating waveforms inside the sequencer language. So you can generate Gaussian or Blackwell or, 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 or rectangular functions or pulses, however you, however you like, right? Where you have the, the input parameters there to define the length and the amplitude and, and the width. Um, 
So we have multiple ways of generating the waveforms or uploading them. And as for the upload times, it's pretty negligible. I think even if you fill the, um, the waveform memory, you're looking at a few milliseconds at most. Uh, and this is, but we also have all these techniques for saving waveform memory, right? So I mentioned the digital modulation. Um, and another method that we have is this play zero uh, command, which means that you don't use waveform memory when you're playing basically no signal, right? So if you have some wait time between pulses, we have the play zero command, so you don't waste waveform memory of playing no amplitude. Um, so we have these different techniques for saving waveform memory, and that also saves on the upload time, right? So the less waveform memory you use, the faster you can upload your sequences. So it's, this, this really shouldn't be a problem. And this also is, is, comes into what I tried to hint at with the command table, right? Is that we're trying to efficiently organize all of these um, different parameters and different, different settings so that like, we can efficiently use all aspects of the, of the sequencer. So uh, yeah, I, I can't give exact numbers for, for what you would experience in your, um, in your, in your experiments for upload times, uh, but we do have a whole tool set for, for really optimizing this, for making it as fast as possible. All right, thank you. Good, so next, let's dive a little bit in the specs. There were a couple of uh, questions about uh, analog specs as well. So uh, the first one here, what is the SHF SG's E knob at one gigahertz, so effective number of bits? And related one, what is the SFDR on the SHF SG output channel? So spurious free dynam dynamic range. Uh, maybe on the E knob, a, uh, uh, I, I good questions. I uh, the I remember when speaking with the uh, RF engineers, they always dis disliked this ENOP spec because it's really a mix between uh, different uh, parts. It's a mix between uh, noise specifications, linearity, and also uh, the SFDR, which is mentioned. And I, th these three, so the noise background, also the linearity, the harmonic level and the SFDR, they are uh, available separately. I checked all of them are at one gigahertz published as well. So you find them on the specs list of uh, uh, the website. The ENOP itself uh, has not been, uh, we, we had no ENOP spec on the HGWG and also not on this one. I believe it's a better way of rep representing the uh, output um, performance. Uh, I probably refrain, like, since there was the explicit question on the SFDR, let me answer that. So for instance, uh, at uh, eight gigahertz maximum output, so this is 10 dBm. Um, sorry, I'm on the way, whether I'm on the way. Aha, uh -huh, is minus 65 dBc. So this is an example value for more values uh, at different frequencies. Uh, you can find them on the specs list on the website. Good, let's take the second one, and the next one, sorry, uh, uh, one for uh, Jan. Does the SHF SG increase gates fidelity? If yes, what is the highest fidelity that you achieved? Please, Jan. Yeah, I think that's a tricky one in, in a sense that uh, to reliably make these statements, I think you will have to find a setup where the uh, signal generator is actually the limiting factor. And uh, I think that part we haven't achieved yet, but uh, there are preliminary measurements uh, where we do comparison uh, with uh, other instrumentation and they look very encouraging. Uh, I don't wanna give out uh, the numbers yet because I think we, we, we still need to have uh, some confirmation in order to, to publish them. But I, I think it, what we can say, it's looking very encouraging. Bruno? Right, great, sorry. Sometimes my keyboard shortcut doesn't work for the unmuting. All right, uh, good, thank you. Let's uh, go to the next question, one for Mark. You mentioned the customer could use the command, tab com command table to speed up their randomized benchmarking experiments. Can you give any details about this? Sure, yeah, thanks Bruno. So um, actually my colleague came up with a few different methods for implementing the randomized benchmarking on, on the HD AWG. Um, so 
I don't know, maybe three or four different ways of doing it. Uh, and actually my favorite involved using the pseudo random, uh, random number generator built into the HDWG. So the idea is that you use the, um, the PRNG of the HDWG to, to generate basically some, some random numbers corresponding, like maybe, I don't know, you wanna play 30 Clifford gates, you would generate 30 random numbers after setting a seed to make it reproducible. And then you can combine this with the command table. So the command table, each entry would have, would correspond to one of the Clifford gates. And so you use this randomly generated number to like randomly select one of the entries of the, of the command table and therefore randomly play one of the Clifford gates, right? So it's a very, you would need then maybe like, I think 24 entries of the command table to store the Clifford gates. And you have the, the random number generator built into the AWG. And combining these two, right, you can, you can sort of generate whatever, um, whatever Clifford sequences you want of, of arbitrary length, right? So you're basically just limited by the number of states, the internal states of the pseudo random number generator. So it's, it's a very elegant, very simple, I feel like even intuitive way to, to, generate, it, uh, to generate these randomized number sequences. Um, I can't, so if you want to learn even more, or hear even more details, I can give maybe a little hint is that uh, you should keep an eye on our block space um, in the next, in, in, the, in the near term future, but yeah. Then you can hear even some even more uh, some even more details if you like. Yeah, and thanks, Bruno. I pass it back to you now. All right. Yes. Yeah, stay tuned uh, on that block, block space. Thanks for the teaser, uh, Mark. So we uh, uh, we we are used up the time that we are allocated um, for the Q and A. So I'd like to wrap up, but there are still questions uh, that we haven't answered. And uh, please know that uh, we will uh, collect these and answer them in written form, publish it uh, on a blog post on our website, and uh, also send you the link to this blog post as soon as it's out. Uh, it won't take uh, more than a couple of days or so until we have this put together. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to close the Q&A uh, session. And uh, I hope uh, you could enjoy this launch event and could take some uh, useful insights into our new instrumentation uh, generation with you. Uh, of course, we would be uh, uh, really happy to meet you at least virtually, if not in person, uh, to give you a uh, uh, demonstration directly and uh, answer your questions about uh, application fit directly. So please get in touch with us. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to close the launch event. And thank you again for tuning in, for your attention. Goodbye. Oh.